Now let's talk about the innovation of the pleura. Uh, the pleura doesn't have any muscles, so there won't be any motor innovation. It's just a sensory innovation that is there. So as far as the visceral pleura is concerned, it's insensitive to pain, touch, pressure, and temperature. The general sensations are missing because the sensory nerves, the spinal nerves, do not innovate the visceral membranes. They receive their innovation from the autonomic nervous system. So the vagus nerve has some afferent fibers, uh, but they have nothing to do with the pain and touch sensations. So the visceral, uh, visceral pleura is, is in general insensitive to pain. As far as the parietal pleura is concerned, is extensively innervated by sensory nerves and it is extremely sensitive to pain. So when we were talking about the, the different parts of the pleura, we talked about something which is known as the costal pleura. The costal pleura is encircling the entire substance of the lung from anterior, lateral and posterior. So we know that the intercostal nerves are there in the intercostal spaces. So the costal pleura it gets its innovation from the intercostal nerves. And it also gets its innovation from a nerve which is responsible for the sensory as well as motor innovation of this structure which is known as the diaphragm. When we were discussing the development of the diaphragm as septum transversum, we talked about the descent of the, of the nerve which is known as phrenic nerve. It has a root value of C3, 4 and 5. It's coming from the neck. So if anything goes wrong with the diaphragm, the pain can be felt in the neck, in the root of the neck as well. So the parietal pleura is getting innovation from the intercostal nerves as well as the phrenic nerve. Having said that, we will talk about uh, certain clinical correlates. There is a condition known as pleuritis, inflammation of either of the two layers of pleura. In case of the visceral pleuritis, it's really very uh, rare to feel any pain. It's usually a painless condition. As far as the parietal pleural inflammation is concerned, it's extremely painful. The pain would be sharp and would be localized as well as it would be referred type. The pain can also be felt in the root of the neck because of the C3, C4, 5 nerve roots of the phrenic nerve. Then we have I, I talked about when, when I was discussing the costodiaphragmatic recess, I said that sometimes there is a, an abnormal collection of fluid in this area. The condition is known as pleural effusion. The pleural effusion could be of many types. In case of hemothorax, there would be collection of blood in between the two layers of pleura. Within the pleural cavity, there would be accumulation of blood that can result from any surgical trauma or rupture of an aortic aneurysm which is you know that the in the mediastinum the aorta is present and sometimes there is an, an obvious aortic aneurysm that can burst and can lead to collection of uh, blood within the pleural space or in the pleural cavity that is the hemothorax then Sometimes during surgery, a surgeon can damage another structure which is carrying the lymph of the entire body, the thoracic duct, which is present in the mediastinum. That can be damaged uh, during surgery and that will lead to the collection of lymph within the pleural cavity. That condition will be known as chylothorax because chylos is lymph, the white colored fluid. Sometimes what happens that there is an extensive bacterial pneumonia, the involvement of the lung tissue is there. And that can extend up to the level of pleural cavity. It can invade through the pleura. That will lead to collection of pus within the pleural cavity. So the condition is empyema and this, this condition would be known as, a, with relation to the pleural cavity, it would be known as the pyothorax, when there is too much pus present within the pleural cavity. Then there is a condition which is known as pneumothorax when there is air in the pleural cavity. The pneumothorax can be of three types. An open pneumothorax which is pretty common that can be a result of a direct trauma to, to the chest wall particularly in case of thoracosynthesis when somebody is putting a drain at the, a chest drain into the, the chest cavity 
that may lead to the rupture of the pleura, parietal pleura by accident. Or sometimes people are taking an intrathoracic lung biopsy, uh, performing a lung biopsy procedure that can uh, cause the open pneumothorax or uh, uh, as I have said that any direct trauma can lead to this condition. What happens that there is an interruption in the parietal pleura and then what happens the air, the atmospheric, atmospheric air enters, it gushes into the pleural cavity and it will cause the loss of intrapleural negative pressure. Now the intrapleural pressure is now equal to the atmospheric pressure. That will lead to the entrapment of air within the pleural cavity. And once the person will inspire, the air, the further air will enter, the inspired air will enter the pleural cavity. And that will lead to a collapsed lung. Because the lung is a very soft organ. Due to an external pressure from outside, from the pleural cavity, it will be collapsed. And that is a very dangerous condition. If it just stays just like that, it will lead to a tension pneumothorax which is a sequel of the open pneumothorax. In that case, what happens is that the, the sucked in air gets trapped inside the pleural cavity and the amount of that air is keep on in, increasing. And by the way, what happened? Because there was air in the pleural cavity that pushed the ribcage uh, forward. Like there would be expansion, abnormal expansion of the ribcage and collapse of the lung. If this open pneumothorax stays unattended that will lead to tension pneumothorax then in that case what happens that the inspired air more and more inspired air will be getting collected inside the pleural cavity and will, that will lead to a complete collapse of the lung of the wounded side that will lead to something which is known as a as mediastinal shift because you can see these uh, central structures are present in the mediastinum so once the lung is collapsed the entire trachea and the other structures present in the mediastinum, they will be pushed towards the opposite side. And that will lead to the compression over the opposite lung. So if this is the left lung, the wound was in the left pleural cavity or the, the, the left chest wall that led to the rupture of the left parietal pleura, the air entered between the pleural cavity and that led to the collapse of the left lung, the, the mediastinum will be shifted to the right side. That will result in the compression of the left of the right lung and there would be that the trachea will be shifted leftward. It's a very painful condition and can lead to death if it stays unattended because there is complete restriction. There would be no breath sound on the collapsed side and there would be minimum breath sound on the compressed side. So the person can die if he stays unattended. It's a very painful and very fatal condition. The third type of pneumothorax is spontaneous pneumothorax. What happens in the spontaneous pneumothorax, there's nothing to do with the parietal pleura here. So the parietal pleura is intact. But what is happening is there is some disease inside the lung tissue. For example, there is like an extensive pneumonia or any cystic disease of the lung that will lead to a bullous, a bulla formation. A, a bulbous portion of the lung tissue will be bulging into the visceral pleura. That can get ruptured. So the rupture of that bulla into the visceral pleura, it will actually rupture the visceral pleura and then we know that what is lying inside the lung is air. So the air, the, the intrapulmonary air will enter the pleural cavity. That will lead to spontaneous pneumothorax. I hope that you have understood the mechanism involved in the open pneumothorax and how the open pneumothorax can get converted into tension pneumothorax and what can happen in tension pneumothorax that there would be a, a distinct, a very prominent mediastinal shift because of the, the person is continuously inspiring. So the air, the amount of air within the pleural cavity is increasing 
the negative pressure is completely gone. So that will lead to the collapse of the lung of that side. That collapse will push the, the central structures, the midline structures, towards the opposite side. And there would be a pronounced compression over the right lung, the opposite lung. And that will lead to very difficult breathing. And by the way, when we talk about all these clinical conditions that can occur in case of pleura, like pleuritis, the uh, different types of effusions like the hemothorax, chylothorax, pyothorax, and pneumothorax, of course, there would be restricted respiratory movement. And it is always a painful condition. The person will be breathless and will be in severe pain. And we need to relieve the, the, the condition. How we will do it? Sometimes we put a drain, sometimes we aspirate the fluid and in case of pleuritis, what, what can we do? We can numb the, that part of the pleura by, a, by you know, injecting a local anesthetic into that space. Now, the, you know, I just told you that the intercostal nerves are supplying the costal part of the pleura. So we can give an internerve, uh, intercostal nerve block. So let me move the camera to another drawing so that we can have a look at the, the positioning of the chest drain and we try to inject an, a local anesthetic in the intercostal space. So here is the drawing that is showing us how we can drain the collected fluid inside the pleural cavity or we can drain an abscess of the lung or whatever. First have a look at this. If we go from outside in, what a needle or a chest drain would be piercing through, which is structures. So starting from the skin subcutaneous tissue, then we have the intercostal muscles, then we have the endothoracic fascia, then we have the parietal pleura. If we have to reach up to the level of pleural cavity, then these will be the structures, the skin subcutaneous tissue, the intercostal muscles, the endothoracic fascia, and then the parietal layer of pleura. And our needle would be, or our drain would be in the pleural cavity. If we are supposed to reach up to the level of lung, two more layers would be added into this list. Skin superficial fascia, fascia subcutaneous fat, the, the muscles, the endothoracic fascia, the parietal pleura, then the visceral pleura, and then the lung wall. Now here, something else is also visible. You know that each intercostal space has its own nerve, its, its own artery, its own vein. So every rib has a superior blunt border and an inferior sharp border. The inferior sharp border is, is in enclosing a groove. That groove is accommodating this neurovascular bundle, the van the vein, artery, and nerve. This neurovascular, intercostal neurovascular bundle is lying safe under that groove present just above the inferior border, sharp border of the, the rib. So if we are supposed to place a drain or we perform a thor thoracotomy or performing a thoracosynthesis, we have to put a drain. So we will be palpating the superior border of the rib and which space we usually select is in the mid axillary line we always go below the level of 6th rib so the 6th intercostal space would be an ideal spot. So we palpate for the, the, the rib, uh, the upper border of the rib and then we follow the, the, the drain over the uh, upper border and enter through the, the uh, you know the intercostal space across the uh, endothoracic fascia and then so on but in, in case of you know uh, pleuritis when there is inflammation of the pleura and, the, and that condition is really very painful and there are there are other painful conditions of the chest wall so what do we have to do sometimes we have to anesthetize the nerve the sensory nerve. So here is the this needle. So you can see that the needle we insert 
by feeling these, the superior border and then the inferior border. Across, along with the inferior border, we will be entering our needle and will be injecting the anesthetic fluid, the local anesthetic fluid, around the, within the vicinity of the, the intercostal nerve. That will anesthetize the nerve and the person will be relieved from, temporarily he will get a relief from the pain. So it's really very important to know how we proceed for the drainage of the accumulated fluid within the pleural cavity or uh, how can we perform lung biopsy, how can we give a local anesthetic injection to anesthetize the, the intercostal space. That's all about the pleura and its related uh, clinical conditions. Now we'll move on to something which is known as the tracheobronchial tree.